follow the example of family members and acquaintances who've gone before them, Europeans dominated the immigrant flow year after year after year. Those national origin quotas stayed in place until 1965, when they were finally abolished as racist and discriminatory. Under the Immigration Act of 1965, priority was given instead to immigrants who had spouses, parents, siblings, or other family members already in the U.S. Some politicians thought this family unification policy would still favor white people because they were more likely than non-whites to have U.S. relatives. But they miscalculated. By 1965, Europeans were largely content to stay put. They were no longer lining up in large numbers to move to America. It was a different story in the developing world. People there were increasingly eager to escape poverty and war or seek economic opportunity in America. That's where the long lines began to form. For every student or worker who got a visa to come to the U.S. from Africa, Asia, or Latin America, there were many family members back home who wanted to follow. This is what President Trump refers to derisively as chain migration, and it's become an explosive issue. The foreign-born share of the U.S. population has risen from 5% to 13.5%, with nearly 9 of 10 new immigrants arriving from countries outside Europe. President Trump wants to move to a merit-based system where immigrants with the skills and training most needed in the U.S. are favored over people looking to reunite with family members. Such a shift, however, would mark a sharp departure from what has been the prevailing pattern of migration throughout the country's history. Tom Jolton, NPR News. going to have to get the hang of uh, unmuting myself. Um, so we're back. Uh, and uh, that was an insightful, uh, quick video to kind of just give a, a brief history lesson. And so I want to take a moment uh, before we get into the introduction of the speakers uh, and furthering the conversation. And I'll probably come back a couple more times with this sort of wrap up or wrap around uh, approach to conducting the conversation. Um, but that's intentional. We want to make sure that we are in equipping you all with accurate information. <clears throat> but then also equipping you with the different parts of the conversation uh, that are happening uh, and that are taking place as a result of, of, of what is happening with immigration. So really quickly, we, we know that the uh, struggle to find a balance when it comes to how to set up an immigration system uh, dates back to the early days of this country. And then we also know in that uh, there it's been steeped with racism and oppression. The first uh, Naturalization Act was uh, for white people. Um, and then there was even the mindset that once there was the, the reform of that in the 60s, that it would still in large part favor uh, white people. And now we're having Having this conversation largely uh, as a result of those individuals still being bothered um, or whatever um, it is by the fact that there are large numbers of immigrants coming from black and browner countries. Uh, what was pointed out is that we are at a large share of foreign born uh, people who live here somewhere upwards of 44 million people, oh, it's listed there, 44.8 uh, million uh, people are foreign born immigrants. Um, <clears throat> 3.1 live in the New York City area. That actually makes up the largest share of immigrants uh, living in, in any one city. And the US actually makes up the largest share of individual or has the largest share of individuals living outside of their uh, native born country. So we have the largest share of individuals who identify as immigrants. Um, I will note, uh, as having worked on the census in 2020, um, these numbers honestly are not the most uh, accurate. And when I say that, uh, I say that um, just speaking to know that there are 
at least upwards of eight to 10 million more immigrants that are not represented by these numbers. Um, those are folks that you can think of when you when you hear conversations around the undocumented um, or folks that have potentially stayed beyond their original uh, visa period. So the, the real numbers are, are, are uh, estimated to be a lot higher, um, but this is what we, we, we tangibly know exists. And in that, I think we have to keep in mind that this is this represents a large share of, of people who are living here, who are, uh, who are Americans, like the others who were born here. Uh, and that's why we're here having this conversation now. Um, a couple of key things to just point out uh, continuously as we go move forward with the rest of the conversation and as we get ready to introduce uh, the speakers is, are things to keep in mind. What immigration is not and what it is. Immigrants come to this country and they uh, they provide, actually, uh, do you wanna go there, Amber? Do you wanna go to that piece and then we'll come back? You're muted. We can go yeah. to this. Thank you, I think Jay, sorry for you. cutting you off. Oh, I'm clearly not the Zoom expert. I apologize, everyone. Um, but we did want to open the floor um, after the, what, the video that we've just seen, um, just to take a few moments to look at these images, um, all of migrants, um, and just think about what comes to mind um, when you see these images. Um, if you think about any news stories you've recently heard, most recently, um, the mayor, um, Eric Adams, his, his comments um, on low wage or low skilled workers, um, what comes to mind when you think of migrants in the city. Um, so yeah, we can open the floor. Or if anyone wants to take um, about 30 seconds to a minute um, and then we can discuss. But also if you're ready, you can just throw a thumbs up in the chat. Feel free to put something in the chat as well. You can share your thoughts there if you don't feel comfortable coming on camera. And this is not just for folks who are immigrants, uh, those who are uh, transplant, so coming in from another city or state to New York City, what have been your perceptions around immigration? How have you feel or how do you feel that uh, immigrants uh, impact your uh, way of life coming into New York City? Folks uh, that are joining who may no longer live in the U.S., uh, share what were your thoughts around leaving, um, the fact that you immigrated to another country. Uh, and then those who are immigrants, um, feel free to share your own personal experiences uh, and stories. I can say for me, um, I had lived in another country for a few months. Um, so it's going from being an American and living in another place, you're already assumed to be an expat, right? Um, there isn't a negative commentation that comes with it, a transplant, you, you know, you, you seem seemingly have um, some status when you go to a different place. It's interesting when uh, migrants or immigrants like that almost has a negative connotation or a, other weight to it when you mention it. Um, even though it is just one person moving from the country that they were born in to another place. Um, so we have Giannis here um, and he <laughs> being from Greece um, and, and having a story um, coming from hardship but then being able to move to America and, and he is an immigrant but his the way that his story is portrayed in the media is a little bit different um, than the others on the screen. I just want to uh, call out uh, something Bianca put into the chat. Immigrants are seen as stealing jobs or resources. New York City is complicated, though, given the diversity of, of the city. How, how this plays, plays out looks very different in other cities. Absolutely. Uh, and that was something I wanted to kind of like move into a little bit to kind of like 
take an, a step further, uh, like I said, before we get to the panelists and start talking about their own personal experiences or resources that they may have, is to really just center what immigration is and isn't. Um, the video started to talk about that and I wanted to, like I said, just take a second to, to go a step further because I think it's important to, to bring clarity to that. Immigrants are not coming and stealing jobs um, from native born uh, Americans. They're not stealing jobs um, from other uh, immigrants. There is a huge uh, job gap in this country. It has been for years. It's not anything new. It didn't just start in 2016 when Donald Trump wanted to run for president. There has always been a, 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 a gap in, in, in open jobs. Like I think at one point, it was like, you know, when we were doing well, it was still like 2 million uh, open jobs out there. Um, and so it, 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 it's not as if they're coming in and stealing uh, jobs or resources. There are plenty of opportunities available um, for folks that, that have that level of access. <clears throat> um, they are not... Uh, they are not perpetrators of more crime. Uh, they uh, that that is a huge misconception uh, that happens is that you know when you have higher immigrant communities, there's there's likely to be more jobs. I mean, sorry, more crime um, that takes place, uh, and that's also something that it's not. Immigrants help to add to the different fabrics. Uh, of their communities. They are our taxpayers. Uh, they are business owners. They're uh, spiritual and faith leaders. So they, they are key pillars of our communities. Um, just really quickly, I was reading an article a couple of weeks ago about a town in uh, Michigan. And for the first time starting this year, they're going to have a Muslim uh, as mayor. And it was a, a, a big thing because this town has largely always been a town of immigrants, uh, Polish immigrants previously. And over the last uh, 50 years, there's been a real shift where those folks have begun to move out of the town um, and individuals of Muslim and Arabic backgrounds have moved in. And what they talked about in this article was the fact that those folks moving in started to rehab uh, rehab the, the, the city. Um, they started to open up businesses. They started to uh, re, uh, renovate uh, homes that were in this uh, repair. So they, they are key members of our society, of our country. Um, and I think it's important that we ensure that as we have this conversation, that's put out there at the forefront. So now we will move to introducing our speakers. Uh, I just really quickly want to keep highlighting um, folks that are talking in the chat. Uh, I, I want to encourage people to continue to, to uh, list things in the chat. Um, and so I, I, while we're getting ready to introduce the speakers, I just want to quickly run these off. Not all immigration is illegal. Um, I, I, I would champion that. There are there's different ways in which one can immigrate to this country. Um, and I think it's important that we ensure that there's resources and information available. We have Sam as well as Paola here to actually talk about uh, what resources are available for folks um, that are uh, that have family members that are looking to immigrate or individuals have, who may already be immigrants here themselves. Um, it's very difficult to get access to visas and citizenship here. Again, we want to make sure that we, when you walk away from this conversation that there is uh, resources that you do have available to you. And uh, Brenda Morris stated, I immigrated to the States from Jamaica. New York was actually the first place that I landed before moving to Florida a couple of weeks later. The culture shock was surreal to me and it wasn't until I got into high school until I started to feel like I was on my feet. And just from and just speaking from where I am in Florida, immigrants played a major role in building out the railroad system that factors into the story of Black Miami. <clears throat> and then Shadira writes, no one is illegal on stolen land. Uh, I, those are my thoughts when that first uh, piece from the video came up around 1790. I was just like, but wait, we, we, we all kind of uh, are, are setting up or perpetuating a, a system of falsities, given that there were people here before. Um, and I, I think that as a part of this conversation, as we think about the nuance of this conversation, um, it's still important to mention uh, that there were uh, individuals living here in this land before uh, any white settlers came along. You're muted. 
you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, um, I also believe no one, there is no such thing as illegal immigration on stolen land, um, but following through um, about 70, a little over 70% of migrants here are um, have some type of documentation. Um, so also to follow the um, rhetoric that uh, there is a plethora of illegal immigration or, or thousands of migrants coming through um, certain channels um, isn't, isn't the fact. Um, but yes, <laughs> without further ado, we would like to introduce our panelists. Um, thank you again so much for joining us and they will be able to share their stories. Uh, we will start with Abigail Chamber. Thank you. Um, Abigail is a Jamaican born mother, student, uh, and part time everything else. Thank you. Uh, she has a determined course when it comes to achieving her goals. She has first migrated to the States in her early teens and would say that she knew her path was going to be through grit, hard work, and that she would be able to achieve it. Since this time, she's been able to navigate high school, uh, go away to being the first. Jen, oldest sibling um, in her family. She is currently completing her bachelor's degree in human services and becoming a better mother each day. We thank you, Abigail. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, like Amber mentioned, I am a new mom. I'm a new wife. Um, I actually met my spouse here in high school, but he's also Jamaican. He migrated here as well, like a year before I did. So that connection was kind of, oh, wow. <laughs> um, I came here, it was hard. It was really, 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 really hard. I, within the first month, two months, three months, I was checking my passport. Like I'm looking at the temporary visa that they put in there to see if it has already expired because I wanted to go back home. High school was hard. I was, well, before high school, I came here and I got in the eighth grade. So I was in middle school. Um, that was hard. I was picked on for my voice, my accent. Um, but, you know, I came here with a purpose to reconnect with my family and to make a greater life to, for opportunities and for growth. So um, with that on my mind, whatever fall or tumble I may have, I have to just get back up, keep my head straight and just keep it pushing. Um, as I think a lot of immigrants as well that come to the United States have a lot of challenges, but I feel like we all have that mindset of we came here for a reason, we came here for a purpose, so we're gonna do it, we're gonna accomplish it. Um, am I missing anything else? Did I say anything <laughs> else? Do you have questions? Um, just actually, we'll, I'm a we'll whole go. book. I'm a whole, <laughs> and I tell, I'm telling you right now, I'm a whole book. I can come on here and uh. tell you everything. That's what we're we'll hold off on, on the larger questions until after all of the intros. Yeah. Thank you. But thank you for that intro. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and next we have Samuel Pierre, who is a current co-founder and executive director at the Haitian American Caucus, a global community development nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide Haitian communities around the world with access to information and resources that will foster self-development and success. Sam holds a master's degree in public administration and finance from Columbia University and a bachelor's degree in strategic communication with a specialization in political science from St. John's University. He also serves as an adjunct professor at St. Francis College and teaches classes like Introduction to Entrepreneurship, um, to college freshmen and sophomores. Sam's ultimate goal is to increase awareness about Haitian migrant issues and Haitian American, that issues that Haitian Americans also deal with on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Amber, appreciate you. Thank you, uh, Jay. Um, and thank you for everybody here at um, 
Do we still call it YP or no? Y'all right. Thank you for everybody. <laughs> I was I was a YP member for a while, and um, um, Jay, remind me to pay pay dues. So I'll I'll, I'll pay my dues to be a y, YP member again today. I uh, appreciate uh, you guys inviting me to join this conversation. Uh, it's the timing is uh, perfect to have this kind of conversation. Um, you know, I am the uh, co-founder of the Haitian American Caucus. We are a community development nonprofit organization similar to another one like uh, the National Urban League um, or the NAACP, where we focus on developing our communities. Um, HST looks at the next 10, 15, 20 years of the Haitian community here, um, you know, in the U.S. and, and Haiti, and we, we, look, we look at how we can develop those communities um, around economic development, um, education and learning and health and wellness. So what we do is we come together and, and we create strategic plans for uh, Haitian Americans, right? Such as myself, who was, uh, who was born here, but born to Haitian immigrants, but then also for Haitian migrants that are coming, such as those who came uh, uh, with the great uh, migration to uh, in Texas uh, a few months ago. And how do we transition uh, these folks back, you know, into, well, not back, but how do we transition them here in America? So uh, we, we spent a lot of time with uh, elected officials, policymakers, um, leaders in the community, business owners, to see how we can uh, get them involved in our workforce development programs, in our job training programs, in our ESL, English and Second Language, so that they can be prepared um, to embark on this journey we call America. Um, and I look forward to uh, answering any questions uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, we have Paola Martinez, who is ser currently serving as a Director of Local Government and Legislative Affairs for SUNY. Paola brings a wealth, of a wealth of experience of government, private, and nonprofit sectors. Prior to joining SUNY, she served as the Director for Lo Social Services, Community Engagement for the Catholic, Church Catholic Charities at the Benson's Houses in the South Bronx. There, she managed a portfolio of 41 resident houses, making this the largest NYCHA development and only the second one in the second largest uh, in New York State. Sorry. <laughs> she earned a bachelor's degree in political science from City College and a master's in urban policy and leadership from Hunter College. In 2014, Paola was named a Shiro for her activism for access to quality education. And in most recently, she was named Miss Fixit for her exemplary work in the South Bronx, especially at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. We thank you, Paola. Thank you so much. How much time do I have if I have to speak now? Uh, um, go ahead, Amber. Um, no, we can actually jump into the questions. Well, I was going to give uh, Paola a few minutes to just introduce herself, uh, give a little bit more about her background um, and express, you know, just your your passion for the topic. Perfect. Thank you. And I do have to apologize in advance because I have a puppy at home. She's a very energetic beagle <laughs> um, that keeps me busy. Um, but thank you so much to Amber and, for, and, and, and the team for putting together this panel. I am really happy to participate today. Um, and I think I, I agree with, with the speakers that I've had the chance to say a few words before me. I feel like this is a very historic moment to talk about um, the accomplishments of immigrants, the accomplishments of women and, and women immigrants as well. And um, as an immigrant from the Dominican Republic now living in Albany, I feel like I am immigrated from New York City to upstate New York. Um, I say this to see that, I, I say this to, just to highlight that New York State is such a big and beautiful place um, coming from New York City, I was always surrounded by people in, in my community. Um, I had the opportunity to work in, in Flatbush, and there I actually met Sam Pierre, who's here today. Um, shout out to you and to the amazing work that you're doing. Um, and everywhere in New York City feels like you're surrounded by your people. So being up here um, in Albany, I do hope to see more people who look like me. And I say this to just encourage folks that maybe thinking about, you know, working in government, working for 
state agencies, working for SUNY. There are so many opportunities in, in a great need um, for these institutions to reflect the real diversity of New York. So thank you so much. And I, and I, and I hope that I can contribute to make this conversation meaningful and uh, inspiring and impactful. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for introducing yourselves. And again, thank you for being here. Um, as you were just talking, Paola, and then thinking about one of the other comments made earlier, um, I want to encourage the audience to just think about something like a, 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 th a thin thread that has kind of been talked about a little bit through here is about where folks are landing and, and what and how that impacts their their sort of adjustment, their their way of living. Um, you know, the the cultural shock that it is to move from New York to Florida, or even come from your home to a place like Florida, to go from New York City to a place like Albany, New York. Um, it's 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 different, um, vastly for those who who have no sort of 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 real attachment to this place who are just coming here from somewhere else. Forgive me as Simba has made his way into the uh, camera. Um, so I want us to just keep that in mind as we're listening and uh, you know sharing more information is that there is, I think there's something to be said um, and something to think about further as we, we hear these stories and, and think about folks that are just coming from somewhere else and then just plopping themselves in a, in a new environment. With that, um, I want to just throw it out there. The first question was, uh, prior to coming here, what was the image that you had of America and how might that have changed today? That's to uh, Paola or Abigail. Um, in Jamaica, um, well, we see America and anywhere out of Jamaica as foreign. And as a child, I thought that America was easy, like amazing, just happiness, rich, you know? Um, coming here, I learned that it's not a bed of roses and you have to work hard to get those riches. You have to get, work hard to live that happy lifestyle that you we may have watched while I was in Jamaica watching on the TV. Um, you have to work and but when you do work and when you accomplish, you get as much as you put in. As long as you know, sometimes I mean, as as a new new immigrant, when you just get here, when I just got here, of course, I don't know of a lot of resources. I don't know where to go for this. I don't know where to go for that. However, in time, you have to kind of navigate yourself throughout the community. You have to read posters um, and kind of reach out for help. But I've been able, I don't have such of a negative story. I've been able to receive the help that I need when I needed them. And for that, I'll always be grateful for that. I think that my experience, similar to uh, what has been shared, I didn't know much about the United States, to be honest. So I didn't have too much, too many expectations. Um, but growing up in the Dominican Republic, I have to say that because of the economic relationship between the U.S. and the Dominican Republic, there is um, a strong influence of the United, from the United States, not only in the economy, but in the political system that, that's prevalent in DR and the relationship, for example, as you know, tourism and, 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 the, and, and, and tourism is the second largest industry in the Dominican Republic and, the, and one of the biggest groups of people that go to visit DR for vacation, um, are people who are coming from the United States and the North, Canada included, but mostly United States. So there is a very strong relationship um, to the point that um, 
when you are in school, you know that you have to learn to speak English because you're probably going to graduate high school or college and you're going to pursue a career that will be required that will require you to speak English. So my mother, who was always a visionary in my family, she at the age of eight years old, she enrolled me in, in English classes. There was a small community um, school and I was part of that program. And I remember um, the first day of, of class, they were teaching us the alphabet. And I went running back home with my, you know, with my notebook singing the alphabet song. I was excited and I was open about embracing the, the U.S. culture, which can be different in other countries. If you live in, in other countries, they may that relationship may be different, right? But I was also very young, so I didn't understand very well, you know, US, US foreign policy. I was just seeing a girl excited about what I used to watch on TV, MTV primarily. And I think that, you know, that's the impact that US culture has in many countries. So coming here, it was um, a surprise for me to see that even though immigrants contribute a lot, um, there is that, uh, you know, great relation in, in the way that, that, that immigrants mostly from the developing world are treated. You know, that can be a harsh reality. Not to say that it doesn't happen back home, like where I am from, from the, in, in the Dominican Republic, we have a lot of issues between, you know, Dominicans and Haitians. There's a lot of tension. And there are many reasons to explain that, right? And, and I don't want to teach you about economic policy, um, but I do think that it's always going to, you know, immigration, race, the color of your skin and your income will make a big difference when it comes to how you are treated in, in the receiving country. And, and knowing that and, and having a mother who valued education above anything, I always knew that even back home in the R or anywhere in the world, I would be able to get ahead if I had a good education. Um, you know, and I was able to work hard and compete. So Thank you both for providing those responses. Um, I wanna pivot a little bit. I'm gonna throw this question to Sam. Um, and I just wanna quickly ask if you could give just like what comes to mind first and foremost of tips that you would give like a new immigrant. Let's say like you you are in the office and somebody says, hey, I got this person here. They just, they just, they just arrived yesterday. What are you telling them are some, just some key things that they should just be thinking about um, to help them just kind of acclimate themselves. Is this for me, right, Jay? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so um, a new immigrant. So first first things first, um we uh you know this this well, this literally happened to us um a few months ago uh back in um August September when we had the the Haitian influx that just came to Texas. Um and you know we all saw it on, on CNN and you know, talk, talks about them getting whipped and um, and the cowboys and all that stuff. But then similarly to most things, uh, it disappeared, right? We don't hear about it in the media anymore. All the immigrants, they all have jobs, they all have houses, they're all driving Benzes, right? Everybody, no, that's not what happened, right? So um, we had uh, worked with a bunch of other organizations in the Asian community to create a welcome center uh, for, for a lot of these immigrants. A lot of them came to New York, New Jersey. There was a, uh, we called it the Haitian Underground Railroad, where we were, we were literally looking for families to house these immigrants until they had their hearings. So there was tons of families that was like, okay, we'll take on a few folks, but there needed to be a welcome center. Um, so uh, we partnered with 16 other organizations all over New York City to create a welcome center for these new immigrants to come in and our welcome center uh, which was located in canarsie in brooklyn at baraka baptist church they would get a package and in the package it would talk about okay 
you are, you know, in Haitian Creole and in English, uh, hey, welcome to America. You know, these are the, the different laws of the land. Um, this is where you can get like food. We have our food pantries that we work with for the different churches. So you can get food three times a day if you're hungry, right? Um, we also have our health um, care professionals. We have the Haitian Nurses Network and the Haitian Doctors Association. And, and you know, and we have the Haitian um, Lawyers Association. These are the organizations that are here to help you with your service-based issues. So if you're not feeling well, you know, let the, the Haitian Nurses Network know about it. They'll find, they'll help you navigate that. They'll help you get to a hospital, X, Y, and Z. If you need an attorney, most of them had hearings, right, to determine if they were going to stay here or if they were going to have to go back or get deported. So if you needed an, an attorney, a pro bono attorney, right? Because most of them could not afford an attorney. So they, they were, we provided them, the Haitian Lawyers Association provided them with the pro bono attorneys. Then we have the, the soft skills and the hard skills, the language, right? You don't speak English, you, you come here, you're speaking Haitian Creole. So HAC, our organization, we have our ESL program, right? Sponsored by Students First, which is a charter school. Um, where we would get, you know, we can enroll you into our ESL class so that you can learn the language. Then you have the, you know, the hard skills. If you want, you know, if you, maybe you want, you want, to, you're gonna have to work, right? You're here. So how do we get you in either one of our construction trades or one of our, you know, handy uh, trade programs so that you can be established here? So we wanted to create a blueprint to answer your question, um, um, Jay. We want to create a blueprint for these new immigrants so that they can understand that they're one, they're not alone, right? Because that's the biggest fear, right? You're in a new country, you don't speak the language. It's like any one of us right now getting dropped into China right now, like right now. Like I want everybody to think about that. If tomorrow you woke up and they said, you have to go to China and they just dropped you there, no family, no friends, nothing. You don't speak Chinese, you don't eat the, I mean, we do eat the food, but you don't, you don't eat the, you can't make it. You don't, you know, you don't know like anything. What would happen to you, right? So that's how we pictured it. Like if I was in China right now, what would I want? What would make me comfortable? What would make me feel, you know, like I can adopt into this place? And we created systems um, for them. Uh, we part, One of our partners is DoorDash, our corporate partners. So DoorDash um, partnered with us to give um, um, Haitian hot chocolate and soup jumu, right, to those Haitians so that they can understand and, and they can feel comfortable. We gave them DoorDash codes. We, we installed the, uh, the app in some of their phones. We said, hey, here's some codes. If you're hungry, you don't understand, this is how you do it. And so we, we're, we're continuing to do things like that to welcome them, to make them feel comfortable. And we partnered with a bunch of other resources that I can talk about later on, on if anyone on here is looking for more resources, in-depth resources that we can share. There's a lot of uh, partners that came together on this one and I'm really, really proud about that. I'm gonna go to Abigail. Uh, if you could tell us uh, a minute or two, um, what's been the biggest challenge of your transition? You mentioned you're a student, you mentioned that you're a mom, a wife, um, you are, as Sam put it, you're in a, a place, uh, you've been here for, uh, for a number of years, but you originally were in a place where you, you, you were unfamiliar. Um, so what's been the biggest challenge for you as a part of your transition? You're muted, Abigail. I think the biggest challenge for me is feeling like I belong. Um, I always question if I belong here whenever I bump, whenever I have, when I'm facing new challenges, as far as maybe financial challenges, um, issues, maybe communicating, um, communicating with other people, trying to get through certain programs or certain services, and it's very challenging. Sometimes it make me question if I really belong here, if I should go back home, if it would be easier if I just went back. Um, I don't feel, I want to say, I wanted to, I was, I say, I was thinking to say, I don't feel like I'm ever going to really like settle in and like fit in. I'm going to stand out. You know, I don't, I think I had to get over the whole part of fitting in and, you know, I had to just accept that I'm going to stand out, but I feel like that's the hardest challenge is just feeling like I belong. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm going to pivot to uh, Sam and Paola for this one. Um, what are we missing or getting wrong with the, the conversation around immigration? I'll let the lady go first. I, I was unmuting my phone. Um, I think that we're missing many things on the conversation regarding, regarding immigration. I think that we're missing the fact that we are living in a very interconnected world. And people are not the problem. We live in a world where you can make a money transfer and someone will get the money in minutes. We live in a world where foreign investment is very important. So we also live in a world where people in New York City, for example, sending money back home is essential to allowing for people back home to sustain themselves. And then the labor and the skills that immigrants bring to the receiving country is what keeps our economy running. I think that the problem with the anti-immigration rhetoric, for example, is that we are putting people against each other. And when we as society members realize that people are not the problem, is the policies that we create. And when I say we, I'm talking about government and the people that elect the government in which we live in, those are the things that we need to look at to make sure that as our society progresses, you know, we're also updating those policies. I think that, um, I think that that's the reason why we need to pay a lot of attention and, and make sure that we are electing leaders that are not putting people against each other. And, and we could see how, for example, you know, I think that Donald Trump made a lot of damage, right? And right now we are like, a, like on damage control. I remember when I started doing advocacy for comprehensive immigration reform in the United States, I started in 2009. And this is 2022. And the topic of immigration reform, I would say, you know, it's not as high on the agenda as it was back then. Um, but they elected the, the, the representatives that we elect to represent us, right? They, when they have the opportunity to make decisions, then, you know, it becomes very political and it's about making the decisions that will be popular for the party or for themselves. So I think that we as society, collectively, we need to understand that people are not the problem. Immigrants are not the problem. I just want to quickly uh, highlight this because uh, Paola, I think, just hit it spot on the nail. It's, it's immigrants are not the problem. Um, and when we look at this conversation in the, con in, in the context of black and brown, we aren't the problem. Um, Mark asked the question, uh, what would you say is the social disconnect between black Americans and black immigrants? And what would you say uh, can help unify us? And, and Sam started talking about the, the, the pride that, that comes about um, you know, from folks. And I would say that that's real, but to answer the question, the, the disconnect is thinking or the idea that somehow because we were born in two different places is that we're, 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 we're being seen and perceived differently. Is that, well, because you were born as a, as a Haitian immigrant or a Jamaican immigrant or a, a Nigerian immigrant is that, that, that you're coming here and being seen differently, that somehow that immigrant, uh, that, that, that is a part of your, your, your personality, your character, your lived experience is recognized before that black or that brown skin that exists. Um, and I would say it's in that that, that really lies the, the, the real disconnect. And I think moving away from this idea that because we were born in two different places and that one may have had their freedom earlier, that that somehow changes uh, the current standing of our position. Yeah, and I would also like to add that 
even that that thought is because of white supremacy, right? That one person gets freedom and that that one person could be, or a different group of people could be better than another. I don't think that originates with us as black people in the diaspora, um, but it can be highlighted um, in certain institutions, um, whether or not it be um, trying to get certain jobs um, in schools. Um, so I, I think that the disconnect Right, doesn't start with us, um, but can could be amplified or manipulated to seem like there is more of a disconnect than what there is from outsiders um, of of the black diaspora of the black community. I second that. I'll go back to Sam. Um, what's what are we missing, or or what's what are we getting wrong when we are talking about immigration? Well, I, um, I think the the. The, the, the point that was made in the chat very earlier where it said uh, something to the uh, something to the effect of you cannot be an immigrant on stolen land. Um, I think I think that that cannot be emphasized emphasized enough. Um, everyone is an immigrant, every single person, if, unless you are a Native American, right, you were not born on this land and you were an immigrant. Everyone is an immigrant. So when I hear things like, oh, immigrants are coming here and how did you get here? Let's talk about how did your grandfather get here? How did your grandmother get here? How did your great great grandfather get here? All right, let's look at the lineage. How, why, and why, why did they come here anyway? Why did the pilgrims come to this land? They came to this land to escape uh, religious or to attain religious freedoms, right? A lot of people don't understand that. This is this whole thing called America was all started because of religion. Religion, yes. All the church goes in here, yes. <laughs> That's what this whole thing is all about. They they wanted religious freedoms from England and they wanted to be able to um, serve their God in the way that they wanted to. And that's why they came here. When they got here, they were like, oh, this is cool. Let's create a society. And they decided to create a society, right? They decided to, okay, if we're gonna live, let's create some laws around how we're going to live. The reason why in God we trust is still on our dollar bill is because our country was started with people who said in God we trust, immigrants that believe in God. That is why no matter how many protesters try to take God out of the dollar, it's not going anywhere, right? So once you understand that background and once you understand where that comes from, then you can now say, well, everyone is an immigrant. Some people came here before others, right? Some people had opportunities to come here before others. Then you have different immigrant groups and immigrant communities that were able to pool their resources together because they understood economic development, period, point blank. Groups came in here and said, okay, oh, this is a capitalistic society. So wait, if I can, just like in the monopoly game that we all play, if I can buy up all of the land, right? And I can acquire wealth, then I can do better than any, everybody else. That is the game of capitalism. So immigrants have come and immigrant groups decided to come and they control the land. So the more land you control, the more wealth you have, right? And the more wealth you have, the more rules you can make, period, point blank. That's how it goes. In this country, the more land you own, the more wealth you have, the more wealth you have, the more rules you can make, period, point blank. So now you have immigrant groups who are now in a, uh, who have created a system, right? And they created different classes so that those who are on top, on the top class, they make more rules, they draft more policy, they take up more space, they breathe more air than those who came behind them. So now if I am a part of a group of immigrants that came before um, Abigail and I was able to now acquire land and acquire wealth, I can make rules that are, are that are going to help my people and they're going to go against Abigail's people. So, hey, I'm going to make a rule that if you wear black t-shirts with uh, Haitian American caucus logos, you get free education. But if you come to the same area and you have long hair and you wear a, a, a what is Abigail wearing? A black sweater, you have to pay. Period. And we have elected officials who look like us, who, who depend on us, right, to fundraise for them. So they're going to draft our policies. 
And then we're going to tell our elected officials, hey, uh, we're, no, we're not immigrants anymore, okay? So when we talk about immigrants, talk about Abigail. Don't talk about us, right? <laughs> we're natives. So we get to change the name. We have the wealth, we have the rules. We're natives, they're immigrants. So when we talk about immigrants in the press, because guess what? We have enough money to have Jay be the editor of the New York Times, right? So we're going to call Jay and say, hey, Jay, I want you to write articles that say, oh, those immigrants, because we're natives. So now we control the minds. So we control the money, we control the land, we control the minds. What else do we need? So that's where I think people get the immigration story incorrect. They think, oh, those people, you are repeating and regurgitating what the media is telling you to say because there's a system that's controlling that media that wants you to say that. That's why different political parties, I won't say which one, are able to spin off this our land our country our jobs right because there's a machine that's that's perpetuating the, those um, ideologies and and those narratives so i think if people take a step back and to ask themselves and say what our hey what country did you guys where did your grandfather come from oh actually we're from um, ireland oh interesting uh, or actually we're from russia interesting right um you can now make better decisions and better judgments once you understand how this whole thing began. That was a great uh, summary. And I, I want to just piggyback off of it um, to, to just like kind of, again, bring it full circle uh, even more. It, it's that history lesson that I think is necessary because at some point, uh, if we are, if we're doing the things that we say we came here to do, um, we're, we're living a life where we're, we're finding fulfillment. At some point, this does become our land. So it becomes really easy the moment you hear our land to be like, yeah, this is mine and, that, and I'm, I'm here and you them. But it's important to go back to, I think that question that was asked before and recognize that this idea that, again, this brown skin, this black skin that we have, because we were born differently, that, 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 that creates the our land differentiation that's that that's that's white supremacy and and racism and oppression that, that that's seeping through there so it is important i think to keep that in mind because uh going back to what immigration is and isn't and i'm going to come to audience questions next um is recognizing that immigrants are not uh, coming here in bus loads and they're not lining up at the border um, to rush the gate, you know, on Monday morning. Uh, the reasons why they're coming here are due to economic despair, are due uh, or historically have been due to famine, have been to do um, to political unrest all of which the United States in itself has contributed to in those particular countries. Um, so I, I really wanna impress uh, the point and example that Sam just provided around thinking about you know, how we look at our, our own selves as immigrants and then how, as the conversation around immigration is happening, how we factor ourselves into that conversation. So I want to open it up before we get ready to close. Um, I do have one more question for the panelists, um, but I wanted to see if there were any other audience questions. Uh, feel free to put them into the chat um, and or uh, pop up on the screen and, and ask your questions. So I'll give uh, a few seconds for folks who may be interested in asking any of the panelists a question and I'll come back uh, and ask uh, one last question of the panelists myself. Um, to that, uh, are there any additional thoughts that you have, Amber, that you want to add? You're muted. Um, I do. I, I'll actually, I'll leave it for closing. Um, Abigail, can you just share a little bit more on um, what you mean by it all starts with education? Um, it all starts with education came to mind because as Sam was speaking earlier about history, the history that he spoke of, I wouldn't have known that if I didn't go to college, it was not something that was taught to me in middle school or high school who came to the United States first and then of how everyone eventually got here. This was not something that I 
was exposed to in my community either. Um, so that's what I meant by it all starts with education. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest uh, plug of this conversation tonight was we walked in with a goal. Like I remember when we first started having this conversation uh, around immigration, we weren't even sure we were going to be able to move forward with it. Um, just, you know, logistical things. And we were just talking about what our goals were. And we wanted to just we wanted to highlight the conversation. We wanted to take this moment to say, hey, what's pressing or what may be pressing in the coming months? And how can we ensure that the audience walks away uh, with some key information, um, some with some facts and figures? So I think, uh, I feel that that was done. Um, so with that, I wanna ask this last question to all of the panelists, Abigail, Sam, and Paola. Um, what's next for you all? Um, and specifically in thinking about it in the, the immigrant conversation, um, you know, Abigail, for yourself, uh, what's next on this journey of growing more comfortable? You know, maybe the goal isn't to 100% to, to fit in, but how are you growing more comfortable? Sam, for you, what uh, initiatives are coming down the pipeline? Uh, what resources can you throw out there to folks to say, hey, this, this is something to be paying attention? Um, or, you know, just in the, the, the grand scheme of, of the civic engagement, what, how can folks be paying attention? And Paola, I would say uh, the same is what resources um, are available to folks and how can folks look at, um, you know, getting more involved in education when it comes to learning more about uh, immigration? If you don't mind, I would like to go first. Um, so then I can focus on the rest of the evening on taking care of the puppy while everyone speaks. <laughs> <laughs> so I you say, saw my dog was here already. <laughs> I would say that um, you know I recently joined SUNY and I don't think this was an accident. So I've been reflecting on my own journey as an immigrant, as an education activist, as an as an educate as a as an immigration activist as well. I you know it this just found me. I was not looking for this role at all. It found me, but. Then I was able to see all of the connections. Um, I when I when I immigrated to the United States in 2009, the first rally I participated was to advocate for for um, educational justice in New York City. So I, I would say that we are all where we are for a reason. Therefore, we have we have a responsibility to open up doors for more people, for more people, especially that look like us, that are looking for for opportunities to advance and contribute to their community and to their family. SUNY is an amazing institution. CUNY is an amazing institution. I am a product of, of CUNY. So I would say that, you know, whatever folks decide to go, either a CUNY school or a SUNY school, look into the programs that are available. Make your way, you know, find, find those counselors, those professors that are gonna help you um, submit that application, write that essay, join those organizations in your campus where you can learn the skills that you need, where you can tap into each other as resources and do not be afraid of asking and say, hey, is there any opportunity for a student like me here? Even if you don't have the right GPA, even if you're helping a family member, right, to, to access these opportunities. As activists, as organizers, as professionals, we also have a responsibility to give back. So, you know, if you need resources, if you need help to even plan a workshop uh, or or a panel in your community, I will be more than happy to help to do that. CUNY has a low enrollment, but not a lack of resources right now. Um, and we need to understand why students are preferring not to go to college. Why not pursue um, the college route? The governor announced yesterday in her speech that the resources, um, that, that, that state resources will also be available for, um, for, for students in colleges that are currently working. And that's, that's money that's on the table. And I remember, you know, applying for financial aid, I was not able to get anything. And I had to 
and I was working. I, I had to, I took a job in retail to be able to cover my tuition. So we have to take advantage of the resources that are available. CUNY students are amazing resources. They also offer, you know, immigration um, legal assistance, and many food pantries. Many of the colleges now have food pantries. Catholic Charities also, the organization that I work for, um, is an amazing resource. And to be honest, I didn't know about these resources. I was lucky I got into uh, CUNY School, the City College of New York, and there I received support from the Colin Powell Fellowship Program, and that changed my life. So I would say that, you know, if you need my help, I am more than happy to help you connecting your community with the resources that are available through SUNY and know that, you know, you're doing my job better. You're doing SUNY a favor as well by helping us promote the program. Because I think that sometimes we come with the mindset back home that, oh, I am not going to ask for help because by asking for help, I may be vulnerable. You know, it's okay to ask for help. Immigrants, we can do it all. We can do it all. We come from hardworking families, um, but it is a good thing to ask for help, especially when it is available. Thank you, Paola. I'll just note, it doesn't get any easier uh, trying to do these things with the dog. Abigail or Sam, uh, feel free to go next. I'll let the lady go first. Uh, I'll just repeat the question real quick for Abigail. What's next uh, on your journey when you think about just being a mom, think about being a student, uh, think about uh, being a wife, uh, think about being an individual. How are you uh, just navigating what's next in your, your journey of, of comfort in here in America? Um, I hope you can hear me. I have some background noise going on right now, but uh, to answer your question, I feel like the 10 years that I've been here have thought me, have made me realize that I got to see my purpose as bigger than just for me and my family, but for other immigrants and for other, for others, for not just immigrants, but for other people in our community. Um, I just graduated SUNY Empire with my associates and I'm still there right now finishing up my bachelor's degree in human services with a uh, concentration in criminal justice because I guess coming here and finding it hard to navigate. However, although I found it hard, I found the help that I needed through counselors, um, connecting, making one connection, they're, they were able to connect me to another organization. Maybe if that organization didn't have the assistance that I needed, they had a referral. So there's a lot of resources I can definitely say and admit to that are out there for immigrants that maybe we are just not aware of. Um, I know when I got my citizenship, I had to wait until I was 18. So I, I came here when I was 12. I was eligible when I was 17 and um, my mom didn't have it. So I had to do it myself. I had my application and everything filled out from I was 17, just waiting to hit 18. And the organization that helped me with that process was the Mercy Center. I didn't really know much. I didn't have the resources is because my story of migrating here, you know, it, it, didn't, it wasn't so great. I didn't reconnect with family and live happily ever after. The happily ever after only lasted a, a period of time before I was, before I became a foster youth. And um, I navigate that. I came through being a foster youth, going away to college. So I had to really look out there for the resources I needed, Google them or just speak up, but they're there and they're available. I was sitting here throughout the entire panel meeting, writing, 
it's a little cute stuff. I'm not sure if you can see them, but it says hashtag immigrants, hashtag immigration, hashtag immigrad, hashtag visas. I have another one I wrote, hashtag immigrant lawyers, hashtag immigrant health heroes for all the healthcare workers. So um, it's just something very cheerful. So did I answer all your questions, Jay? Or did I go off track? No, that was great. Uh, I think that was uh, that was beautiful, honestly. If, that, if that, anyone that, have any other questions, um, I'm here. I'm gonna kick it to Sam to uh, answer what's next, um, what's down the pipeline, what, what what are you working on, what's available. Actually, Jay, if you don't mind, and Sam, I do have to say that Abigail has benefited from the two organizations that I work: Catholic Charities, Mercy Center, and SUNY Empire. So you need to become an ambassador, Abigail. I hope the two of you connect after this. Then I, yeah. I, I think that would be something powerful that would that can just morph into something more. Definitely, I would love to. That would be great. I am thinking of making my way into politics, into policy yeah. specifically. So um, my master's, that's what I'm thinking of for my master's degree. Yeah, I can I can give you some advice. I, I got my master's and I was at the CUNY law, decided not to go, but if you need any help, I'm here. Thank you. I'm definitely going to reach out to you. <laughs> Sam, you, take Sam. it away. Um, yeah, so uh, first and foremost, there's a, there's a ton of resources um, that pe anyone who's interested in learning how you can support and help. Um, I have a list that I wrote down, but I'm not going to go over the list. Everyone has a, uh, uh, a Steve Jobs machine or a Bill Gates machine that you're using. I tell my students that all the time. So, you know, you can go to the New York uh, Immigration Coalition, right? Um, I really, we really do a lot with the New York Immigration Coalition. Uh, one of, uh, actually, our lobbyists is on their board of directors, so we're, we're constantly partnering with them. Go on their website to see all the resources that are there. The top three, I would say, for legal, right? Because what people don't realize is that the um, the most important um, issue for any immigrant is their status, mm -hmm. right? That's the most important thing because that's what makes you um, what they call illegal versus legal is their status, right? So the attorney and the law is the most important uh, piece um, for any immigrant because that's going to determine the resources that you get in this country, right? That determines whether you can vote, that determines whether you can have access to the resources that Americans have access to. So um, for those who are looking for legal assistance, the National Immigration Law Center, um, they do pro bono attorneys, Immigration Legal Resource Center, um, they do uh, pro bono legal uh, work and the immigrant defense uh, project as well. Um, and I can send uh, Jay an email with those and he can, he can be, um, you know, Jay or Amber can definitely share that with everyone. But uh, to conclude, I want to say that, you know, um, for those who are on here who are, you know, children of immigrants or African Americans, you can play a role in helping the immigrant community with your voice, with your voice, right? You got to understand all of the laws in this country are written by elected officials. What does that mean, Sam? Someone elected them. So in order for them to become elected to the power that they had, a group of individuals had to elect them. Therefore, they are beholden to their constituencies. So if everyone on here, how many people is on here? 19 people decide that we are going to stand in front of, uh, we're gonna go stand in front of Grand Army Plaza and we're gonna make noise and we're going to stop cars from traffic in the middle of the road and we're gonna get um, blow horns and you know, we're gonna get arrested and we're going to roll around on the floor and we're gonna call our media friends. We're gonna get the attention of the people who make the laws, right? Now, legislation and policy does not happen overnight. They're not gonna go overnight and say, okay, immigrants can do whatever they want. However, the awareness of the issue is what we're looking for, right? You literally, there's people on here who have 600, 700, 800 friends on Instagram, right? Who are very popular on TikTok. You can take up an immigrant um, 
cause. You can go on Twitter and find out what's the new immigrant cause and you can do a hashtag or you can do a TikTok or you can go on Snap or you can go on IG and put it in your stories, right? You can take that hashtag and raise the awareness and start the conversation. For those who are um, about this life and you want to take it to the next level, you can come to an organization like Haitian American Caucus or Life of Hope or, or you can go to Medgar Evers College and volunteer to help folks who need help. There's immigrants who need to fill out forms. They don't know how to speak English. You got a bachelor's degree, you know how to fill out a form. Go volunteer for two hours at Medgar Evers College in the Immigration Center to help fill out forms for immigrants. There's immigrants who they don't know what the different diets are, right? They're, they're coming from another country, right? They don't know where to shop, right? Go volunteer to tell them, okay, you can go shop over here, K Market, you know, Trader Joe's, X, Y, and Z. You, there's so many ways that you can help two, three hours of your day. Granted, I know it's, you know, Omarion is out there and it's not as safe as it used to be, but there's so many different ways that you can participate and you can volunteer. People online, right? You can literally go on your Facebook Live and do have a, and invite me or Jay or Abigail or Paola to have a conversation and have all your friends here and learn about how they can volunteer. So um, the power is in your hands, it's literally in your hands. It's all about how much time you want to devote to it. People, um, people spend their time and their energy on things that matter to them. So once again, my name is Sam Pierre. Thank you for having me. My email is in the uh, chat. Feel free to email me. Uh, reach out and we would love to be helpful as much as we can. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Amber. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are an infinite resource um, just as people, um, whether or not it's time, um, tweeting, um, using your voice to connect with someone in your community, um, what, donating, that we can allocate ourselves to build up the Black immigrant community or communities of color um, in our, around ourselves. Um, we, can, we can come with that charge. Um, knowing that there are differences from where we originate from, but we are still in the same fabric. Um, so that the differences are minor in comparison to the power that we have and the potential that we contain. Um, also, if there is, um, any way that we would be able to help you connect to volunteer. Um, if you have any other questions on um, current events that are happening around migrant issues, um, any type of um, political offices that you wanna be in contact with in your neighborhood, um, you could let us know and we would be happy to connect you um, with those resources uh, and people. And so with that, we have come to the end. Uh, I want to quickly, before we, we head out, uh, sum up tonight's conversation. Uh, we, we talked about immigration uh, in a couple of different manners. We talked about it from the lived expect experience perspective, as well as the policy side um, and the, the systematic perspective. The key thing that I think is important to stress um, as a part of this conversation as we walk away are a couple of things, is that immigrants are not the problem. Um, because folks are coming here, whether it be from a black or, or brown country or a more white European uh, country, is the Euro, uh, sorry, is the immigrant is not the issue. It's about the policies um, that we have either supported or not done enough uh, to reform over the, the years. Um, so with that, it's important to keep in mind um, that we are all immigrants. Um, folks that are coming that are immigrating here now, um, are adding to the fabrics of our community. They are supporting uh, our educational system. They're supporting our, our tax base and our businesses. They are our healthcare workers. They are, they are the individuals um, that New York City's mayor uh, decided to uh, disrespect uh, in, 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 in conversation. And I, it's important to recognize that those individuals are important, that they're coming here with their own set of experiences and their own set of insights that that 
that that make us who we are. This this country is not America um, without immigrants. Um, and so with that, I, I want to encourage everyone to keep in mind that 2022 is an important, important, important election year. Um, you may be tired of hearing uh, how important these elections are, um, but they are vitally critical to your everyday living. Um, as pointed out here, those elected officials write the laws that impact whether your family members are better are better able to immigrate here down the line. They impact how current immigrants are, are received, um, how they can go about getting their, their citizenship, citizenship so I think it's important that we all know um, that this is a, a crucial, critical election year and that it's important that we are all a part of that conversation. Um, so with that, I thank you once again. Uh, it is 8 p.m. 8.01 on a Thursday night. So I'm going to say uh, thank you once again. Go have a good rest of your evening. And please, 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 please keep in touch. Um, whether it's uh, joining the chapter as a whole, um, we are always looking to add members, or whether it's joining the CNE committee um, to further help plan out and execute uh, the events coming up. We have Soybeanie uh, happening this spring. So uh, folks that are interested in carrying on uh, this piece of the conversation, getting involved uh, in other aspects of civic engagement, civic engagement and economics, please feel free to reach out uh, to Mark Evelyn, Eunice, myself, or Amber. Um, other than that, thank you. Have a good night. And we are happy that you joined us.